Thank you, Rich. And I'll say thank you to Pippa, who's, I can feel her presence. <laughs> <laughs> the program. The, the program is yeah. And to the rest of the colleagues uh, of the Electoral Integrity Project. Uh, we're a little bit like uh, misfits here, the practitioners. Uh, there's a couple of us in the room, um, and you know, we kind of coming into the circle of the academic research from uh, a distance, but I think it's really good that uh, this kind of forum is provided. It's actually really important that the, these two streams find ways to, to cross more often, so I'm, I'm very glad that this is happening. And I'll thank Pippa again when I see her. Um, so again, Avery and I from the Carter Center, this is very much an election observation practitioner perspective on the, the issues we're talking about. Our paper and several other papers that we've done in the last few years are attempts to uh, explain and describe a project that we've been working on for more than five years, probably closer to seven now, that we call a, our election standards project, democratic election standards. And uh, essentially what we're trying to do with this is to provide a framework for assessing the quality of elections. And it's led to the creation of a database that's built on public international law instruments and, and many other sources. And we've tried to use it to frame our work in elections. I'm going to give a little bit of background on this project, uh, some discussion of the, the content and the structure of the database that we've produced. And then Avery will take the second half and describe some of the companion ma materials and tools that we're developing with the project. Uh, why international obligations in our in the framework that we've uh, built? Uh, as you can see up here, it provides an objective, transparent framework for assessing the quality of elections and making recommendations to improve future processes because of its basis in international law. I know some of the earlier papers have talked about this, and we've seen a convergence in the last five to ten years in the observation practitioner community around approaching elections integrity and the quality of elections from a perspective of how do they stack up against criteria that are derived from public international law. Note that um, what we're not talking about here really uh, in any major uh, way is an attempt to deter fraud or to necessarily think that we're going to improve the quality of democracy over time. As election observers, we hope to have some, some of that kind of impact. But our essential goal is, and our essential task, is to, to assess the quality of an election and to do it in a thorough, comprehensive manner as best we can, as well documented as we can, uh, and to try to become a trusted source of information about the quality of that election. And I think that's uh, a message that we're really trying to get across to, uh, to others who are studying our work. The international law basis is important because of the standing of public international law. It's recognized as uh, having authority. It also gives the ability for our methods to become more systematic and grounded. It's also transparent and objective in that these documents are available for, for any public interested person to, uh, to see. And we also hope that it will foster more dialogue in the observation community and the democracy assistance community so that we can really have more and more harmonization in the methods that we use. So how have we done this at the Carter Center, our election standards project, as I mentioned? Uh, we certainly built on a lot of important work of many of the organizations in the field who have did, done similar things before us, in particular the ODIR OSCE. Uh, and the EU and NDI and others, and increasingly the OAS has become a pioneer in the, the last several years in the work that they're doing. We've been very collaborative across our organizations, and again, uh, the basis of this is public international law. I'm going to quickly just give you an introduction to the database that we've built and how it's structured, and then again, I'll turn over to Avery. So we worked with a small team inside the Carter Center and, and several outside experts and we've reviewed more than 200 sources that are in the database that we built, uh, including international treaties and conventions that people have talked about in, er in earlier presentations here, uh, regional treaties and conventions, judicial decisions, and this is a particularly important one, especially on the treaty bodies that have the role of providing interpretations of the, of the, the conventions themselves. ICCPR and all the general statements that have been, been produced are really important sources of of international obligations. We've also looked at the teachings of highly qualified publicists. That includes some of you and maybe more of you in the future. 
Uh, and in that category, we've also looked at handbooks of observer organizations and other documents that become evidence of, over time, an increasing pattern of state practice that can also reinforce uh, public international law. Uh, in this work, uh, having reviewed those sources, the framework that we've come up with of the obligations that are relevant to democracy are presented in this table. Uh, on the left, what we refer to as overarching macro-level obligations that are in almost all of the major instruments, we combine into this single box of genuine periodic elections that express the will of the people. And that's really what a democratic election is at a macro level. But in order to have that, you need all these obligations on the right to be fulfilled <laughs> to some degree. Uh, you'll uh, recognize many of them from the uh, the reference in ICCPR, many uh, fundamental freedoms and human <laughs> rights in international law sources, but also at the top, uh, these more general kinds of statements of the rule of law is actually an obligation in public international law. And one that is often missed is uh, the requirement that states take the necessary steps to implement and ensure these rights are met. And that really sh is a you know, an effort to really push states to, to meet their obligations. There's a requirement, a requirement that they, they do that. We looked at those obligations uh, across the constituent parts of an election. This slide here uh, shows in an electoral cycle kind of way uh, along the top that what is a post-election period over time becomes a pre-election period, then an election, and then a post-election and pre-election. If you look at that kind of time period across, across the top, the different parts of the elect election process here are laid out when they occur. And these are, from the election observation perspective, the topics that we're familiar with. We've divided the election into 10 basic parts. It's essentially the same as the ACE uh, website structure. Uh, there's a couple of sections that they have that are, in our view, mainstreamed across these, like technology and uh, another one. But essentially, these are the 10 major parts of the election that, that we've looked at when we reviewed those sources of obligations. What we get is a, uh, a large matrix and with uh, two dimensions to it. On one dimension, the, the part of the election, and the other dimension is the, the different obligations and how they're relevant. So this chart shows you which of the absolute obligations you can find have relevance to different parts of the electoral process. And in essence, we have a, um, a large database. Let me go back on that one so you, I can introduce it better. Uh, a large database where all of this is gathered, and it's actually full source text quotes from the sources that we have analyzed put into a database. So this example here is from the IC ICCPR, Article 12, and those are elements that uh, relate to the freedom of movement. And so the actual database has the full text quotes there from that source as well as many, many other sources that have similar text about the same kind of obligation. And we have more moving parts to this slide. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot that we had all this. So uh, all that we have done at the Carter Center besides pull this text into the database is the, the shaded light blue is our summary statement in very, very brief form of what all those text sources are talking about. Right? And that leads me to hand this over to my colleague, who's going to show you a bit more about how you can actually use this, which is what we've been spending the rest of our time doing the last several years, is to try to make this more usable. So uh, as David said, I'm going to talk a little bit more about um, sort of how we've been implementing this approach in the context of our election observation missions um, and some of the alternative and additional tools we've been developing as part of this process. Right now, we're working on a methodology handbook that really um, does two things. It serves as a companion reference guide to the database, sort of summarizing all of the information that was in 500 pages of an Excel spreadsheet into a Word document that's more like 100 pages and so we hope is more digestible uh, to our missions in the field. 
but also trying to make very clear the link between the obligations and the international law sort of theoretical framework and the questions that our observers are asking uh, when they are deployed. Just as a quick reminder um, on our observation methodology, um, we have basically two kinds of observation. We deploy at the Carter Center and sort of accepted uh, methodology for election observers. We deploy long-term observers who in our case are deployed around the country um, at times for several months in advance of the election. And they really gather qualitative data that is submitted in a narrative report. We also have short-term observers who are deployed for a much shorter period right around election day, and they complete observer forms and sort of submit quantitative data, and we put those together as an observation mission to release our, our findings. Um, we are working in a tight time frame in the context of election observation missions. Yes, we're working for months before the election, but we have to take all of that information, combine it with what we see on election day, and try and release a preliminary statement of our findings generally within about 48 hours of the election. Um, this table is in the paper. It just sort of provides an overview of where we're going with our quick indicators and our data collection questions. On the left, you see uh, the overall obligations. Then we've started developing indicators that our um, teams can use to analyze the data coming in from elections, from, uh, from the observation teams, and then uh, data collection questions that can guide our observers in the field. This is an example of the templates that we use for our long-term observers. We take these uh, questions, some of which were in the uh, illustrative questions uh, column of the previous table, and include them in the templates that we give to our long-term observers so that they are guided by obligations and the data that they're collecting when they're conducting interviews. Um, just, this is just to give a little overview of how we go from the obligations to indicators to then the LTO questions. And then we get the data back from the long-term observers in this format of a written report. You can see that we do get quite a lot of information. This is just an excerpt on one part of the electoral process, voter education, from one observer team in one week. And this is from Egypt. So we're getting a huge amount of information. Um, but because we are using obligations to guide them in their data collection, it makes it much easier to analyze the information that we get back from them against obligations. This is just a quick example. You can't read any of it. Don't even try. I think I win the award for tiniest font. Um, this is just an example of how we have compiled uh, long-term observation reports. This is, again, using the, um, the example of voter education in Egypt. Um, we have essentially, in this table, taken the excerpts of the reports from all of our teams from all of the weeks um, between the first round of voting in Egypt for the presidential elections and the second round of voting and started trying to understand um, how they meet the indicators that we laid out in the table that you saw a few slides ago um, to see the degree to which they are meeting the obligations across provinces on a week-by-week -week basis. So we can really start sort of analyzing that data. We've done it in a red, amber, and green scale just for this example, and you can see there's a lot of red. So generally, I mean, we, didn't, we weren't super happy with voter education in Egypt, to be completely frank. Um, just to talk a little bit about how we use it to develop our checklists, um, this is an example of the table that, that David also showed earlier with a slightly different color scheme. Um, looking at voter education, we um, pull the questions that we develop for our observation forms directly from these sources of international law. So here we see that the um, United Nations Human Rights Committee in their general comment has been very clear in their interpretation of the international covenant that voter education is essential to the enjoyment of the right to vote. And so we start asking questions such as, are voter education materials display displayed inside the polling station in our observer forms so that we are collecting the data that's directly related to the obligations? And there you can see it's included in the checklist. When we get the information back from our short-term observers, we can look at it in two ways. One is that we can look at um, pull out the questions that are specific to different parts of the electoral process. So in this case, we can see that um, there were questions included on the checklist that were relevant to voter education, even though it was election day. You know, did people seem to be voting, understand the voting process, were materials displayed? But then we can also use election day data to understand the degree to which specific obligations were met. And so here, using Egypt data from the second round, we can see um, some of the responses that we got from our observers on secret ballot.
Just a note on the data to say that we try and frame our questions so that yes is a fo that indicates that they followed procedures and no is that there's some sort of irregularity that the, uh, that the observer should provide more detail on. And so in all of the instances where there is a red bar, we also collect um, narrative information from our observers about what they saw so that the core team has a better sense of the context of the irregularities. This process has led us to a number of difficult questions that we are continuing to grapple with about how we weigh different obligations. Are there some obligations that are so fundamental to a democratic election that should you fail to meet them, the election is basically does not meet international standards at all? Um, are obligations more important in some countries or political context than in other countries? And finally, does there appear to be some sort of fluctuation in the relative importance of obligations? Um, um, depending on the democratic development of the country. And with that, I'm out of time, but just to say that we're still thinking about those things, so if you have thoughts, let us know. Thank you.